Well, when we finished reading chapter 39, which was called Losing and Finding, um, we know that um, VG is staying in the home for children with Selena Ante and also Muthuna Rule. We know, of course, that Ruku has passed away from the dengue fever and um, VG is very bitter about uh, Ruku's passing, of course. Um, not just sad, but bitter, not dealing with her emotions. And it kind of picks us up where back to where we were at the beginning of the book where Selena Ante was asking her to write the letter. And um, we already knew based on what VG had told Ruk, not Ruku, what VG had told her rule about her mom's religion, her mom's Hindu religion, and about how her mom was always praying um, and it never helped her uh, dad to not be so cruel. We already know that VG was somewhat embittered toward religion. She didn't really put a lot of um, faith in religion. So we discovered that Selena Ante is Christian um, and because she puts up the nativity scene of Jesus and Mary and Joseph because it's Christmas time at the at the children's home and there are a lot of there's some Muslim children staying there and some Hindu children staying there some different religions and so they she tries to Selena Ante tries to provide a way for all those kids to um, you know worship their religions or whatever um, because she knows that human beings when they go through bad things when they go through adversity it's called which is a fancy word for negative things and negative experiences in life that one of the ways that helps them survive it and get through it um, is their faith and whatever type of faith that is. But um, VG just pretty much refuses it. And in chapter 38, she has it out with this other teacher there called Priya Auntie. And Priya Auntie gets upset with her because she's yawns during um, one of the services and she's disrespectful um, toward religion and she makes a comment to Selena Ante that they shouldn't be disrespectful of my non-religion and then Selena Ante tells her maybe you could she puts the word God and the word good side by side each other on the on a piece of paper and said maybe when we pray instead of you thinking about if you don't want to believe in God to help you, she said, maybe you can believe in good and you can just do, make up your mind that you're going to live your life doing good and helping others. And she kind of has it out with a rule because a rule tells her she's going to have to get up, basically get over herself and that, um, you know, Ruku was their family too. And that she's going to have to start focusing on the positive part and, um, do something good and positive with her life um, instead of just dwelling on feeling sorry for herself. So um, the last thing that we read on 39 was um, she finally, it was Easter, she finally went to visit Ruku's grave with Arul and Mufu, and instead of putting flowers on the grave, she put um, an Easter egg there and they were talking about how um Ruku would have loved it because it was chocolatey sweets and you know she loved sweets we remember that and she said then VG said well she would have loved the flowers too and um they were talking about Easter being new beginnings because it's usually in the spring and that's why eggs and things all symbolize uh Easter um, because it's it's new beginnings and also if you're a Christian Easter has to do with the resurrection or when Jesus rose from the grave, it's new life. It's Christians believe that when Jesus rose from the grave, it was him making a way for us to go to heaven. So it's just new opportunities. And that's kind of how that chapter ended. Um, but she also accepted that no matter what she decides to do with her life, one thing's true that Ruku will never be back. That part is over. Chapter 40 is called Hope. I'm going to visit a place I'd love for you to see, Selena Auntie told me the next day. You're so, 
so you're excused from attending lessons. I shrugged like it didn't matter one way or another, but I felt myself flush with pleasure. She'd chosen me to go somewhere with her as a special treat. She drove us to a white bungalow, three stories high, an oasis of calm in the middle of all the noise and bustle. Selena Ante smiled as she parked the car. This is a school for children like Ruku. Children like Ruku? Anger sputtered out of me. No one's like Ruku, I yelled. No one. VG. I put that very badly. Selena Ante did her lip. There's no one in the world like your sister. I didn't mean those words to sound the way they did. I'm sorry. I screwed up my eyelids tight so tears wouldn't, no tears would fall out. I have a sister, VG, a sister with a disability. My eyes flew open. We never were as poor as the two of you, but we weren't rich either. She came to this school. It's a school for young people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. For a while, I said nothing, but her words were a key, opening my locked heart. Where's your sister now, Selena Auntie? She works at a print shop. She used to have her own little place on the other end of the city, but recently she got married and moved farther away. We meet as often as we can. Will you take me to see your sister sometime? Sure. Now, are you ready to go in, VG? Yes, and I'm sorry for yelling. Everyone in the building greeted us with smiles and vanicums, which is their greeting where they, they bow. Everyone seemed to know and like Selena Auntie. We were shown into an office, sitting behind a desk beneath a picture of the Hindu god Ganesha was a wiry young woman. She sprang up and pressed her palms together in greeting. Biji, this is the director, Selena Auntie said. Dr. Donham. Call me Donham Auntie. Auntie VG. Come, let me show you around. We followed Donham Auntie into a sunny, high ceilinged room. We stayed by the door, peeking in. A boy around my age was sprawled across the floor, drawing on a large sheet of paper. A little girl of maybe seven or eight was playing with colored blocks. In the center of the room, a few children of all ages sat on straw mats on the floor listening to a silver-haired teacher who sat cross-legged, reading aloud from a picture book. Some of the children looked up at us curiously. You could have been among them. You could have been here at this school, learning from teachers who'd pay proper attention to you. A silent flood of tears rushed down my cheeks. No one seemed to notice I was crying except the girl with blocks who marched over to me. Don't cry, she commanded. Come and play with me. Thanks, I said to her, trying to swallow my sobs and hold my voice steady. I'll, I'll come and play for a bit. Why are you thanking me? Her forehead wrinkled in confusion. I didn't give you anything. I was sad, and you made me feel better. I made you better? Her face glowed like a moon, and her plump cheeks dimpled. I made her better, she announced to Dan Manti. Who is she anyway? This is Vigi, Selena Andy said. I'm Lalitha. Come. Lalitha took me by the hand and led me to a shelf full of painting supplies. Let's paint, she decided. We must put newspaper on the floor so it doesn't get messy. The two of us spread out the paper and we started working. At least I did. Lalitha selected a brush and chewed on its end thoughtfully. I dipped my brush in the paint and tried to draw a yellow circle for the sun. Lalitha was watching, which made me nervous because I wasn't the best painter. The lines I drew for the sun's rays came out pretty wobbly. I dropped a bit of blue paint on the bottom by accident, so I smeared it and made a river. Across it, I painted a bridge. On the bridge, I painted four stick figures. What's that? Lalitha put her finger on one of the figures. A person, I said. You are a person. I am a person, she wagged her finger at me. That is not a person. It's the best I can do. What are you going to paint? I can paint well, Lalitha said. Watch. She swished her brush around on the paper, making a great yellow blob in the top right corner. Is that a sun, she asked, or I asked. 
No, Vigi, the sun is outside. This is just a big yellow dot. <laughs> right, I smiled. So we painted dots and lines and all kinds of shapes. We made a mess and had just as much fun cleaning up, skating on the wet floor we'd mopped. That was the best painting class ever, I told Aletha when it came time for me to leave. Thanks. Come back, she said. I'll teach you some more. On the way home, I asked Selena Auntie, can I go back there again? Maybe work at the school? Sure, Selena Auntie said. I might be able to arrange for you to assist the teachers when they need an extra hand. Maybe help with reading or writing or art. And maybe someday you could even teach there. Since you'd gone, I hadn't given a thought to my dream of becoming a teacher. Selena, Selena Auntie's words made my dream glimmer again. Faint and far away, but not lost. All right, you guys, let's look at the journal questions for chapter 40. And again, there's only a response question and vocabulary. So we've got the word oasis. And again, you've got to be careful with context because when you look up oasis, it means a lot of different things. Um, in this context, um, she's talking about in something that's in the middle of all of her sadness and difficulty, um, something that makes her feel better. Wiry, you got to think about that one as well and look at what that one means. And again, always consider connotation. So look back and see um, how it's being used and see if you can figure out what it means. All right, our response question. Explain how Vigi's trip to the school affected her. So remember what we talked about her attitude was and then what it did for her um, after she had visited the school. Okay, let's move on to chapter 41. Chapter 41 is called Bridges. Let's go for a walk, Arul said when he returned from his lessons at the carpenter shop that afternoon. Can't, Muthu scowled. I have to write. I won't be rude to my teachers 100 times. Why? Arul said. What'd you do? This morning, Priya Auntie said, if a fruit vendor asks us for, for 20 rupees and we give him 50 rupee note, a 50 rupee note, what would we have left? And I said, it was a silly question because if a vendor asked us for 20, I wouldn't give him 50. I'd bargain, bargain him down, not give more than he asks. And she got mad. But I said, it was just as important to learn how to bargain as it was to learn subtraction. All the other kids agreed with me, but that only made her madder. And she gave me extra homework. <laughs> a rule started lecturing Muthu on staying out of trouble, but I grinned at Muthu. It was good to know he was getting his spark back. I remember he'd been real sad since um, Ruku passed away, and now he's turning into his old self. And truly, he does have a point. And we already learned by how Priya Auntie dealt with uh, VG. Um, for dis what she called disrespecting the religions, that Priya Auntie's kind of what we would call in my day hard nosed. She's not, doesn't have that little bit of kindness about her that we like for teachers to have and for adults to have. She's kind of a, a real strict by the rules kind of person. And she also doesn't understand, she's working at a home for children that have been on the streets and been homeless. So they might have a different perspective than she does. That also would have been a good teaching moment about what bargaining is, because maybe some of the kids didn't know. When I recognized where Arul was heading, I stopped, but he wouldn't let me turn around. Soon we arrived at the fancy house where Kuti lived. He was out in the yard. Kuti's coat shone with cleanliness, sparkling in the sunshine like a silk sari. Remember the saris, the fancy dresses that the ladies wear. We watched him through the gate, playing with the girl. The gardener was nowhere to be seen. Prabha threw a ball, and he leapt and caught it midair. She patted him, and he licked her hand, looking at her the way he used to look at you. What's the point of this trip, I said to Arul, to show me Kuti doesn't miss Ruku anymore? Before I could stomp off in a huff, Kuti raised his head and galloped toward the gate, barking madly, his tail wagging so fast it almost disappeared from view. Prabha ran after him, and when she saw us, she swung the gate open. Kuti bounded over, placed his paws on my knees, and pushed me off balance. He'd grown so much larger and stronger. We collapsed together, 
his tail thumping me. Fiji! The girl surprised me by remembering my name. You don't look nearly as scruffy as you did last time. She sounded disappointed. What happened? I changed my line of work, I said. Where's Ruku, she said. Couldn't come. I buried my face in Kuti's fur. He smelled clean and fresh. Want to see the bed I made for Kuti in my room? Prabha asked. I give him dog biscuits every day and I wash him once a week with special dog shampoo. Dog shampoo? They not only had shampoo, special biscuits for dogs, but even special shampoo. Come on, she said, I'll show you. We don't have time now, I said, because I was afraid her mother might not want me in her house, even though she was kind and I was a lot cleaner than I had been. And it was enough to see that Cootie was doing well. Cootie put a paw on my foot like he was telling me to stay, but I scratched Cootie behind the ears and got up. Go, Cootie, I said, go home. When will you visit again, Prabha asked. Sometime, a little said. Sure. As we walked away, Cootie gave a little whine, but he didn't try to follow. He knew where he belonged now. I thought you would like to see how happy Cootie is, Earl said. You visited him before, I asked. Just once, Earl said, long enough to show me two things, Fiji. That he still loves us, but love doesn't stop him from living and moving forward because that's how life moves. On our way back, we visited our bridge. We looked for the spot where we'd pitched our tents, but we couldn't tell the exact place. A cool breeze stirred the river as the sun sank down in the sky. We should get going, the rule said. Just a bit longer, I said. Part of me felt that if you could still talk to me, this was the place where I'd hear your voice loud and clear, here on this bridge, which was the closest we had come had to a happy home. I whispered your name again and again, but you never replied. Or maybe I just didn't hear. All I heard was the river slapping against the bank endlessly. It's getting really late, Earl said. Come on. Selena, Auntie, and Muthu were standing at the front yard, peering up and down the street into the gloom. Muthu waved wildly as soon as he spotted us, returning. And Selena, Auntie, practically ran to the gate to let us in. Thank goodness you're here at last, she said. What kept you out so long? Told you they'd be fine, Auntie, Muthu said. Why were you so worried? Because this is the first time a call and a rule have ever been out on their own in the dark without me or something? That must be it. She tousled his hair and smiled at us. Guys, tousled means she just kind of took her hand and messed it up a little on top. But please, next time you want to stay out late, warn me so I don't get scared. I promised I would. And I thought about Selena, Auntie, and Muthu's concern. It felt good to see them feeling happy that we were back safe. For the first time since we'd left the bridge, I had the feeling that I'd come home. 41, the vocabulary word is tousled, and we just talked about that. And the response question, why do you think a rule wanted VG to see Kuti? Um, and we know the straightforward answer, but think deeper. What do you think, not just to see how Kuti was doing, but also what little bit of extra wisdom did he add on to that? You might need to go back and look um, at that. Remember, the PDFs are in our book club. Um, section of our classroom too. So what's the deeper meaning to why he wanted her to see Kuti? All right. 42, past and present. After assembly this morning, Selena Auntie beckoned me to come see her. Surely you can't be in trouble again, Earl whispered. <laughs> you said the prayers today, Muthu rushed to defend me. I saw. I'll tell them a call. Thanks, Muthu. I ruffled his hair. I promise I'll let you know if I need your help. I followed Selena Auntie into her office. Sorry to keep you from your class, but it's your lessons I want to discuss with you. She played with a pen on her desk. You have a good place here. A great place, I said. Glad to hear you say that, BG. I'm happy to see how you have adjusted, but I've been thinking about where you need to be. What do you mean? Our teachers aren't used to teaching children as old as you or as good at writing and reading as you are. There are larger schools where you would have greater opportunities, better facilities. You want me to leave? That's not what I'm saying. This can still be your home, BG, and you can still visit Muthu and the rest of us anytime, but there's a good boarding school where some of our children have gone before. I spoke to the head, and she'd welcome you. I haven't said I'll go. No, she looked me in the eye. But if you're serious about teaching at a school someday, 
you'll need to study a lot more and get much better training than we can give you here. Just think it over, okay? It's so strange, Roku. Just when I started thinking of this as my home, Selena Auntie decides I need to move on. On and out of here. I know I need to welcome the chance Selena Auntie is offering me. Except I don't want to go. You were taken from me and I'm not ready to take myself away from the two best friends I have left. Not yet. That evening, Arul and I sat on the bench watching Muthu chase the little kids who cackled and screeched. It was good to see him in such high spirits again and to hear him hooting with laughter. When he came over and joined us, I started telling them about my conversation with Selena Auntie. She wants to send me to a school. We're at school, Muthu said. A bigger school, I said, and explained her offer. Super, a rule thumped me on the back. Glad you're so thrilled by the thought of me leaving, I said, watching the kids running about. But I don't want to go. I don't want you to go either, Muthu said. Stay here, Aka. Never mind what a rule says. Don't be silly, a rule smile left his face. And he got all serious. She should go. Go and do something she's been dreaming about. If I leave, who'd look, up, who'd look after Muthu, I asked. I don't need anyone looking after me, Muthu pushed, pushed his lips out so far. It looked in danger of falling off his face. I'll be okay if you go, but I won't like it. I won't like it at the other school either, I said. They'll all probably have nicer dresses and lots of... You'll always have nicer friends, a rule interrupted, and nicer family. You'll always have us. I couldn't argue with that. I put an arm around each of them and drew them closer. All right, let's look at our chapter question. Chapter 42, facilities is the vocabulary word. And again, look at the connotation, look at it in context, how it's being used, because what does it mean by that? And the response question is, explain why VG is hesitant about leaving to go to a different school. All right. Chapter 43, Our Father. The next morning I got a visit from our father. Definitely not the one in heaven. How did he know where to find me, I asked. Selena Auntie, when she told me, he, Selena Auntie, when she told me he was here to see me. Then, and then, sorry guys, and then the answer came to me, my letter. Probably Selena Auntie said. You don't have to see him unless you want to. I'll see him, I said. Do you want me or someone else to stay with you? I'm not scared. If I didn't meet him face to face, I'd be afraid he'd try to track me down some other day when I wasn't in such a safe place. I'll meet him on my own. As you wish, Selena Auntie motioned at the room where he was waiting. We won't let him take you away by force. But of course, if you decide you want to leave, that's up to you. Head high, neck may be a little too stiff. I strode in like a princess. What do you want? I said to a paw. He held out a package, a gift, like he thought it was enough to win me over. I looked at the dark hair sprouting in bushes along his fingers. I could feel his hand coming down across my cheek. Whip fast, leather tough. I don't want it, I said. I don't want anything from you. His eyes glittered with anger. You're my daughter, he said. Mine. I can take the two of you home, whether you want me to or not. <laughs> you can, I said. Not the two of us. Ruku's dead. What? He stared and then whispered, you're lying. No, I said. I wouldn't lie about something like that. A strange sound came from him. A kind of growl that was anger and pain mixed up. His hand actually trembled. He let the package flop into Selena Auntie's, onto Selena Auntie's desk. Maybe all that Selena Auntie and rule had said about God and Yesu made some kind of difference because all of a sudden I felt sorry for him, the way he stooped, his arms hanging limp. On the street, I'd seen dogs fighting, snarling, ripping at one another until one gave up and tucked its tail between its legs in surrender. That was what a paw reminded me of with his head hanging and his chin almost touching his chest. See him in, seeing him standing that way, I knew I was larger than he would ever be. For his pitiful sake, I ripped open the package he brought. Inside, there were two things. 
a hand-carved wooden pendant, and a hand-carved doll, just like Marapachi. You, you made Ruku a new doll? I couldn't believe it. But there she was in my hands, Marapachi's twin. He must have made the old one too, I realized. Yes, I made it for her. He knelt and put his hands together. Come home, please. Give me another chance. I'll never, never, never hurt you again. He shook with sobs, and I put a hand on his shoulder. Rivers of tears coursed down, crooked across his cheeks, his stubble-covered chin. A flash flood of forgiveness rose in my chest. It was a strange kind of forgiveness, mixed with desperate pity and hope, a flood that threatened to drown me if I didn't fight it. At last, I understood how Amal felt, why she gave in every time he said he was sorry. I understood her eagerness to piece together her shattered image of him, her need to keep hoping things would get better somehow. She must have felt just as sorry for him as I felt when I saw him kneeling on the ground. Because at that moment, he truly meant it. He really wanted to be a better man. I almost did what a ma would have done. I almost gave up the freedom and the future I could have. That's when I heard your voice, Ruku. No, you say, stay, VG. Your voice was like a beam of a lighthouse cutting right through my fog of pity. No, my voice was calm. My whole body was calm. This is home now. Don't be, don't be angry. I'll give you anything, anything. My future is here, Apa. His knuckles clenched and then unclenched. Tell him all I love her and don't ever, ever lay a finger on her again. Yes, he bowed his head and I'll come again to visit you. Bring her, I said. Bring her to visit me. I promise, he said. For the first time in what felt like forever, the touch of his rough hand was gentle on my chin. He held it, held my gaze, and then he let go and walked out the door. His steps measured, his footfall softened. I hope he'll keep his promise, but even if he doesn't, his visit left me feeling better. He took away some of my anger. I think anger that had been pressing down on my chest. There's the stone again, you guys. Now that I had let go, let my anger go, it felt like my heart had more room. After a paw left, I marched up to Selena Andy, who was waiting anxiously to hear how it had gone. You know that boarding school for girls, the one you wanted to send me to, I said? I'll go. Yes, she slammed a fist into her palm. It's wonderful. You'll be so happy there. I'm so proud of you. Then the two of us just sat there and smiled and smiled at each other. At dinner, I told Arul and Muthu about a pause visit and how much better I'd behaved than I'd ever thought I could. <laughs> There's hope for you yet, Arul said. Yes, Sue is getting through. No, I said. It was Ruku's voice I heard in my head, not Yesu's. Not in your head, Arul said. You heard her voice in your heart. Waiting for him to lecture me about you being in heaven, I chewed a mouthful of rice. But a rule only said, if you really think the only place Ruku's still alive is inside you, you know what you need to do, right? What? You've got to start loving yourself like you loved her. Like you were able to allow yourself to even love your dad. Not sure if that was love exactly, I said. Anyway, there's something else I need to tell you too. What? Mithu said. I'm going to that other school Selena Auntie talked about. <gasps> Muthu stuck his tongue out at me, but Arul whooped. Yes, Arul said, you're going to do so much with your life. What if I'm not good enough? I voiced my fear. Then you can come back here, Muthu said. I hope you're not good enough. Don't be silly, Arul said. She'll become a teacher just like she wanted, and she'll build a school for kids like us. Who'll you name? Who'll you name your school after, Muthu asked me, as if I were building one already. You should name it after our father, Arul said. Remember our father, O-R-T, Narian, hallowed be thy name. <laughs> I was so amazed to hear him joking about God that I said, totally serious. I'll name it after you, Arul. Ruku and Muthu and you. After me, Muthu grinned. Then I guess I'd better start paying attention to my lessons. Chapter 43 questions. Um, the vocabulary word is lecture. 
Um, and again, look at the context, how it's being used, and give a connotative meaning here. Um, the question is, do you think that people can really change? And that this is in context with a pa and his issues with drinking um, and how she almost forgave him the same way that a ma always forgave him. But can people change and how? Has a pa fully changed on a deep internal level? That means inside. Or is he just talking for the moment? Will that stick? VG tells Selena Auntie she will go to the boarding school after meeting with her father. How and why did this event cause her to change her mind? So how did meeting with her father cause her to decide to, to go on and go to the boarding school so she could accomplish her dreams? And the response question, describe how VG's father's visit affected her. And these two kind of go hand in hand, actually. You can do that. All right, chapter 44. Wherever you are. As I write to you, Yuruku, I travel back. I feel the rain on our backs as you crouch on the road trying to save worms. I hear you humming to Kuti, holding him close in your comforting arms as a firework explodes at Diwali night. I see your proud smile as you hand the balloon vendor your very own money at the beach. I see your tongue between your teeth as you concentrate on finishing a bead necklace. I see your fingertips as you hold the, or the orange the gardener threw at us. I see you fling your beloved doll at the driver to defend me from danger. I see you and Muthu belly laughing together on the br our bridge. Your laugh is so strong, so strong, it makes me smile even now just remembering. Writing is an odd thing. Writing today in this book, I realize I sometimes saw things the wrong way around when they were happening. All this while, I thought I'd looked after you, but now I see it was often the opposite. You gave me strength by never letting me get away with a lie, by showing me small miracles, by laughing at all the wrong times. Together, you were such a good team. And now I'll keep trying, Ruku, to carry your laughter with me and march forward. To love you, but live in today, not in yesterday. Moving ahead doesn't mean leaving you behind. I finally understand that. And I guess how you live matters more than how long you live. Every happy moment we had Every bit of love we shared still glows. We're still together in my heart and always will be. So I'm living with my whole heart, Ruku, and imagining with my whole mind. Imagining while Letha, my new friend, all grown up, living on her own, laughing away with a rule and Muthu. Imagining me all grown up too, a teacher at last. Imagining you drinking cold, bubbly soda in a nice, fancy palace and burping louder than Muthu ever could. Imagining you can hear me say, I love you, Ruku. Imagining so hard I could almost feel you patting me again, see you beaming, hear you saying, Ruku loves Fiji, right back. And our vocabulary word for chapter 44, beloved or beloved, however you want to pronounce it, either way is correct. Um, and again, look, look at that in context and what that means. Um, and the response question, what do you think is the biggest lesson VG learned over the course of the book? So this would be our theme for VG. Now, there would be many themes that we have discussed and could discuss to learn from the experiences that the girls and boys had in the book, but let's focus on VG for this one. What would be a lesson that she learned over the course of the book? And then after so much trial, how did the end of the story make you feel? This is your opinion. What emotions did it evoke? And I'm just going to tell you, Ms. Thomas had to pause a couple times. Are you left with any lingering questions? So think about it. 
think about what we've read about, what we've learned about. Are there any questions or things that you wonder about? And also remind me, don't let me forget to go back and look at our um, anticipation guide and see if our answers changed to any of those questions. Um, a lot of times we don't read, like when we're done reading books, we just, we're done. We don't read the author's notes or any extra information like that. But I'm, And I was the same way when I was young, but as I've gotten older, I've gotten to where I don't skip these things because there's a lot of extra information in there. Um, and as I read through this author's note, I decided to include it in our audio book because um, one of the reasons that Miss Bray and I chose this book is because in this time that we're living in, um, we felt, which is always necessary, but we felt it especially necessary to read about the experience that these children were having, because one of the things about reading books, it does teach you lessons, but when you read about other people's experiences, it helps you appreciate your life more. And, um, so the author's note, she kind of tells us where she got the inspiration for the story from because it is realistic fiction. Um, so I want us to read the author's note together. It says, as I was growing up in India, my mother was the only single mom I knew. Despite our own fraught economic situation, that means they were poor, she always devoted time and energy to charitable causes, especially those that provided education for children who were even less privileged than I was. Early in my life, I was introduced to the work done by the Concerned for Working Children, an organization that has now grown and become established and been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. I also spent time at the village school in Nilba, a night school for children of fisher folk, and a school for Roma children. Um, these would be like what we would have called gypsies. I don't know if you've ever heard of gypsies. We'll talk about them again when we um, read our next novel. And I met people involved with organizations such as the Mobile Creatures or CRY and Balvaman. Even after I moved to the United States, I remained interested in issues confronting children who lack so many of the privileges that I now have. <laughs> Notice she moved to the United States and she now has all these privileges. There's a reason, folks, that we're blessed. In recent years, along with my mother and late aunt Visalem, my aunt Renuka, and my uncle Subra, I have had the pleasure of visiting other schools and homes in India where children are offered support and assistance, such as the VXL Educational Trust. Selena Auntie's Refuge in the book is based on these homes and schools. Despite all the good work that is done, however, many children face problems that result from a lack of understanding lack of resources, or lack of compassion. Guys, compassion is love mixed up with understanding and caring. This story draws largely on first-person accounts of what real children have undergone. In writing it, I not, on, not only interviewed adults and children, but also re relied very heavily on detailed journal accounts. Many children visited us and confided in my mother, sometimes deeply questioning the existence of a higher power. And I faintly recorded the tales they told about their struggles in diaries that I kept until I left India in my late teens. Viji's character is modeled in part on a young girl called Indiria, who referred to herself as my Akka, and often spent long evenings with my mother recounting her early life and the terrible trials she had faced. The characters of Ruku, Arul, and Mufu are also based on children I knew, and many of the incidences in the novel are drawn from first-person accounts. Out of respect for the real people on whom the story is based, I felt I could not change fundamental events that took place if I truly wished to honor their memories and their lives. In India, a staggering number of children, millions, are homeless. Guys, millions are homeless. In cities, it is commonplace to see homeless children younger than Muthu eking out a living on the streets as best they can. Some children run away because of domestic violence, as Viji does, hoping to find a better life. Others are abandoned. 
Homeless children often face discrimination based on caste, gender, disability, ethnicity, and so on. Many of these children are proud of earning an independent living, and they fight fiercely to hold on to their fragile freedom. A common form of work is sifting through trash to salvage and sell recyclable material. Rag picker children may earn less than a dollar a day. And although the exchange rate from dollars to rupees varies, and the cost of articles also fluctuates greatly in India, these children are always paid hardly anything for their work and are forced to live on shockingly little. Unfortunately, these children are in constant danger of being forced into even more terrifying situations. Many seek to enslave and abuse them. Hunger and poverty are not issues that affect South Asia alone. They are global problems that millions of children's, children and adults face. In many parts of the world, children suffer without any end in sight and without proper food, clothing, housing, and education. They are frequently subjected to violence. As I wrote this novel, I also became increasingly aware of the plight of children in the United States and in my own home state of Rhode Island, where some children still experience problems as basic as hunger and homelessness. Many children remain strong despite suffering even more severely than the four in this novel. And this book is written with the hope that children everywhere will someday live in a world that treasures and nurtures them.